Hello and welcome to another lesson in the System Security Certified Practitioner course. In this lesson, we'll be covering topic 7.1, Identify and Analyze Malicious Code and Activity. On the agenda today, we have malware, malware countermeasures, malicious activity, as well as malicious activity countermeasures. Okay, so let's begin. There are many different types of malware, and it is often useful to categorize them by broad characteristics. For example, end user interaction, Ransomware, scareware, and many phishing payloads display screens which attempt to get users to take some kind of action. End user or endpoint passive monitoring. Screen capture, keystroke loggers, webcam and microphone access can gather information about the user, the system, its surroundings, etc. without needing the end user to take any actions. And command and control functions. These are payloads which look to install or create process and subject IDs which have elevated privileges or otherwise can grant capabilities which allow them to take greater control of the system. Malware then. Malware is the general name given to any type of software which comes into a system without knowledge and consent, performs functions which are not authorized and diverts computing resources from an organization or individual. It could also damage data, install software or computer hardware in the process. Malware is generally classified according to the action the attackers wish to achieve. For example, creating backdoors, encrypting data and demanding a ransom for the decryption key, and monitoring a device information such as GPS, etc. Malware usually involves the use of a vehicle or package, which is introduced into the target system. It is then used to release or install a payload which functions separately from the vehicle. For example, a Trojan horse malware is named according to the way it disguises its payload within a wrapper or delivery program, application, video file, etc. and seems attractive. Viruses and worms get their names due to the way they self-replicate and infect other systems on a network in a similar way that diseases infect humans. The difference is that viruses infect one machine and then expand outwards to attack others. Worms infect many instances on one machine before expanding outwards, which makes it difficult to get rid of. Malware can be used to perform essentially any function on a target system. Rootkits are a special class of malware which use a variety of privilege escalation techniques to insert themselves into the lowest level functions in the operating system. This then gets loaded and enabled upon boot up before most anti-malware or antivirus gets loaded and enabled. This can provide complete and undetectable control of a system to attackers. They are rarely seen and are a favorite of advanced persistent threats. Malware can resemble the behavior of otherwise legitimate software. This can lead to false negative errors and false positive errors. This is when either legitimate programs are flagged as malware or malicious programs are not flagged and let run on the system. There are numerous methods of inserting malware into a system, including through mounting a removable disk drive, users interacting with the application which seems legitimate, or through emails. So what are some malware countermeasures then? There are a number of things to consider when considering malware countermeasures. For example, whitelisting. This provides control over what is allowed to be installed and executed on systems. Protecting the software supply chain. This can provide methods of only allowing digitally signed code from known sources to run. Prevention measures. These are attempts to keep malware from getting a foothold in the system. Access control enforcement of device and subject health and integrity. Involves quarantining and remediating subjects. There are a number of strategies which can be employed to achieve these security goals. For example, whitelisting can be enforced by examining all incoming email or restricting classes of subjects or end users from browsing to or establishing connections to sites which are not on the trusted sites list maintained organizationally. Anti-malware applications are generally designed as host intrusion detection and prevention systems. They mostly use signature and rule-based definitions in an attempt to determine if a file is malicious or not. Active anti-malware defenses running on a host can also detect behavior by a process which seems suspicious. Good anti-malware scanners routinely search through high-capacity network storage systems and perform the following functions. Scanning the system for malicious files, inspecting digital signatures of directories, inspecting processes, services, and tasks in main memory, inspecting macros, templates, or other files, moving suspect files or objects to quarantine areas, inspecting operating system control parameter sets, monitoring system behavior, monitoring incoming email and web traffic, and finally, monitoring connection requests from sites. The biggest challenge here is dealing with the numerous different types of malware which appear every day. 
Anti-malware solutions should be seen as just one part of a defense strategy and should be coupled with encryption, access control systems, etc. So what is malicious activity then? Malicious activity is any violation of an organization's policies regarding acceptable use of its information systems, information assets, and IT infrastructure. There does not have to be intent to harm in order for an action to be malicious, nor does there have to be an intention to gain or profit from the activity if it causes harm to the organization. Any action an employee normally takes could be considered malicious if taken in the wrong context. For example, using a mass mail application for personal use to promote one's own business would be malicious and against company policy, as this business could then be associated with the organization. There are a number of methods which can be used to detect this malicious activity, including the following. User behavioral modeling, these use machine learning approaches to determine what normal business behavior looks like and uses this baseline to alert to behavior which is not considered normal. Endpoint behavior modeling. The same techniques as those above are used to determine when endpoints are being misused. Access control and security logs. Insider threats are people who have access privileges to your organization and systems and work for the organization, who then abuse those privileges in a deliberate way. These can often result in some of the most significant breaches in an organization. User Behavioral Analytics, or UBA, refers to the use of machine learning and statistical approaches which aid in detecting a possible security risk involving employees. Analytics algorithms look for patterns of data collected about a model behavior while also looking for data which points to changes in behavior which diverge from a known and understood pattern. Different types of analytics represent different timeframes which management need to appreciate as they consider potential security implications. There are a few different types that you should be aware of. Descriptive analytics. These look at what happened using profiles of behavior or signatures of past events for comparison. Inquisitive analytics. These look for the cause of an event or a number of an events. Prescriptive analytics. This type of analytics combines descriptive and inquisitive analytics as well as other approaches to synthesize recommended courses of action to deal with forecasts. Predictive analytics. These seek to forecast possible or likely courses of action which the system or person would take during a time period by modeling the behavior of the system. It is worth noting that UBS monitoring can go beyond just the surveillance and recording of a user's interactions with IT systems and also include data from third-party systems, social media sites, and general traffic. So what are some malicious activity countermeasures then? There are a number of controls you should be aware of which can mitigate the risks mentioned above, including the following. Physical controls. These can mitigate the introduction of malware, exfiltration of data, or the entry of unauthorized persons into your premises, and thereby into contact with your information systems infrastructure. Logical controls. These implement the Lioness's share of the security policy decisions that the organization has made. These configure hardware, operating systems, network, and application-level security features. Administrative controls. These ensure that risk management decisions, and therefore information security decisions, that management and leadership have made are effectively pushed out to everyone in the organization, and that they are used to drive how physical and logical security controls are put into effect. Hardening strategies. This involves ensuring procedures are created for all IT assets and that those procedures create the right mix of controls for handling vulnerabilities. Isolation, quarantine, sandbox and patching techniques. These are used when individual user, subject or endpoint behavior suggests that something may be happening that deserves more in-depth investigation. Quarantine or isolation of an entire LAN segment and all systems on it may be tremendously disruptive to normal business operations and activities but indicators of compromise may make that the least unpalatable of choices. And finally then, engaging with end users. This involves motivating, educating, and training them to be as much a part of an organization's information defensive posture as possible. So that brings us to the end of this section. In this section, we had an overview of malware, malware countermeasures, malicious activity, as well as malicious activity countermeasures. So that brings us to the end of this lesson. In the next lesson, we'll cover topic 7.2, implement and operate endpoint device security. Thank you and see you then.